Let's just pray, shall we? <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your presence amongst us today. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We, doubt, we just want to say thank you, Father, for your faithfulness, without which, Lord, we'd be finished, Lord. And we give you praise. We just commit this time to you. Thank you that you are right here, Lord. You are merciful, gracious, and kind. And we give you praise that your word is truth. And Lord, we ask you, Lord, just to open us up to you today, that you'd continue to open us, to have that responsiveness to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I, don't, I don't want you to look at the top word, really. It's not to, about a top word. But um, when I've been um, to the opticians, I don't know why, but the last couple of times, um, they've wanted to show me, or not just show me, give me this bag. I've had, this is the second one I've had, which is quite unusual. But one of the words that it says here is, empower your vision. And that's what we're going to just be really getting a little bit of foundation on that today. Empower your vision. And really, just to see the words on the page, uh, you need these. And I've gone up to 2.5 now, which is quite high. So I've started at about one something and then, and then gradually gone up to 2.5. And... Um, Praise God that my long sight is increasing since I've had the cataract operation. Um, my long sight's increasing. But we all need to empower our vision. Empowering that vision is really comes from God. God gives you a vision, but it needs empowering. And it needs legs. <laughs> it needs empowering. So we're going to go to Nehemiah in the Bible, excuse me, and there's so much in Nehemiah, more than we really can take in at this time, to be honest. So I'm going to just really speak, just to see what kind of man this man was. To me, he was a great man. I believe he was a humble man, a strong man, a man of prayer, and a man of faith. So I'm just going to just read um, in chapter 1. Bear with me concerning the names here, but it says the words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Ananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men and questioned them. I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and in disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night. For your servants, the people of Israel, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. 
we have not obeyed the commands, decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah, he wept and grieved over the ruin and destruction in Jerusalem. He mourned and he fasted and prayed. He confessed the sins of the Israelites, including himself and his father's house. It said in Amos 6, and the Lord was saying this to the complacent in Israel, He said that they do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. You find that in Amos 6, verse 6. This is a man that was grieving over the ruins of Israel. The wall had been broken down. The gates had been burned down. And he said his words that there was in disgrace. And he felt that disgrace. He, 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 he realised how great Israel was because God is great. Because God was giving them the grace and strength to be the very people that he wanted them to be and to display the splendour of God. And they was his splendour. But they've been taken away because of unbelief, because of their sin. They've been taken away. But now, was the time for the walls to be rebuilt. The temple had already, with Ezra coming, so many years before, I think about 12 years before Nehemiah, he came um, with the king when the king was in his seventh year, Nehemiah came, well, 13 years it was, Nehemiah came in the 20th year of the king. The Persian king, that is. So here we have the situation where he's weeping over it, where he's weeping over the, the, the city, he's weeping over what has took place. And in two... Verse, chapter 2. He was the uh, cupbearer and he, he took wine to the king and he gave it to him. But the king saw that he was sad in his presence and he hadn't been sad in his presence before. So he asked him, the king asked me, it says, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill this can be nothing but sadness of heart. And it said, I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favour in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my fathers are buried, and now this part, so that I can rebuild it. 
Here you have Nehemiah weeping, fasting, grieving. Yet God had put something in his heart because he knew the time was for rebuilding. He knew that now was the time for the walls, for the gates to be put in place, for the bars, for the bolts, everything put in place right there. He knew that back there in Jerusalem it needed to be built and rebuilt. He's talked of it, not just of the walls, but of a city that was in despair, that was being discouraged, that was, that was really, basically, he was saying, was ruined. How could he be happy? How could he not be sad and grieved while this was happening? So he was, he was a man that knew how to grieve and weep over what was taking place. If we could see how far this nation has gone away from God, we would weep and grieve with the Lord. Did you know that? If we could see that this nation, we, that was the nation of the word seemingly, have gone so far away that now even in our soaps, even in consist consistently in our so soaps, it's showing that we've turned away from God. Everything that's in this world, everything is decaying, crumbling and falling apart. And Jesus gave his life so that we could have life in him and show the way because he is the way. If we could see how the church in this nation, all I'm talking in general, is so wishy-washy, it's so divided. It's so full of unbelief. It's so mis... does not understand. If we could see that, like this man Nehemiah, we would weep and grieve before the Lord. Now this sounds a little bit heavy, don't it? It sounds a little bit on the heavy side. But there was positiveness in this word from Nehemiah. The positiveness was that God was going to build them up and make them strong. Amen. The positiveness was, he was saying, as if he was saying to the people, get real, see what it's like. Obviously, if you go to... It, with <laughs> Praise God. If you go to the situation right back in Jerusalem, they was allowing it to happen. They were, their hands was hanging limp. Their hands was hanging limp. They was in dismay and despair. And here you've got those words. So that I can rebuild it. I believe he wasn't speaking on a selfish note, saying, I, I, I. I believe God had put it in his heart and it would be a we, we, we will rebuild it. But it had to start somewhere. It had to begin somewhere and it began in this man's heart. It began in this man's heart. I like the part when it says about praying. Then I prayed. The king asked him a question. What is it you want? You see, God was going before Nehemiah. That's what's so amazing. God was going before him. And the king was saying, what is it you want? If you go back in the scriptures somewhere in Ezra, before this, you'll read that this very king, who oh, I can't pronounce his name, by the way, this very king, right, Stop the work for a while. After a letter he received, he stopped the work because there was enemies that didn't want it. So before the temple and everything, he stopped the work. But now, these years later, God was working in the situation and he had a man right there serving him with his wine. 
even test, tasting it so it weren't poisonous. They did these kind of things in them days. Wine testers and what have you, beforehand. And he had him right there. He was a cupbearer before the, before the king of Persia. And he had him right there at that exact time. But I like that part in 4 where it says, he asked him, what is it you want? And it says, then I prayed. It says of Smith Wigglesworth, and this is what he's supposed to have said, I don't pray for more than half an hour, but I don't not pray for less than half an hour. He prays continually. As God leads him, he prays. He don't go beyond half an hour without prayer. That's what he actually says. He don't go beyond half an hour without prayer. Nehemiah was doing that here. He asked him a question here, quietly. I, he, then I prayed. Then I prayed. He was a man of prayer. And I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and I'm reading this again, and if your servant has found favour in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so I can rebuild it. It was a man of prayer, and even though it don't say the word vision, even though it don't say the word empower, God empowered him. Do you know why you know God empowered him? Because despite all the obstacles, despite everything that come against him and everything that come against God's people, of all the opposition that there was, all that that tried to stop him, he was successful. God made him successful. Well, that should be exciting. <laughs> it should be. Probably I've started a bit to, in the boots, I don't know. But if we're not a people that realise that the people out there desperately need us, and if you've not got Jesus, if you've not surrendered to Jesus, you're perishing. Amen. It's the truth. It's the truth. Jesus gave his life so we wouldn't go to hell. And we need to come to him and, and, and allow him, we've been singing about surrendering, allow him to heal us as a church. To set us free as a church from our apathy, from our complacency, from our unbelief. Because it's like that, I'm talking nationally. Yet God is at work within us, amen? God is at work within us. And so you have to come to that point where we realise where we are and see, before it even happens, you see, you have that vision and you see people rising up like the dry bones in Ezekiel. Like the dry bones. You see them. You see the church rising up. You see people being convicted and coming to the Lord. You see it and you stand on God's word and believe that he's going to do it. Amen. So, if not the foundations is not there, we've got no chance. So there has to be that foundation and there's no other foundation that can be built on except Jesus Christ. That's what it says. And the, our works and everything right, will be tested by fire. It tells you in the scriptures. By fire. And I tell you, the Lord is going to bring his fire. He really is. He's going to stir his church. Isn't that amazing? He's going to do wonderful things. I'm just trying to get a bit of groundwork here at the moment. I really am. Oh, there's so much. Where can you see what took place? He persisted in prayer. He said, let's start rebuilding. He persisted in prayer and action in spite of difficulty 
or opposition. Do you want to see it where, where, where these things happened? <clears throat> First of all, there was somebody called Sam Ballot. You'll see it in number 2, verse 10. In, when, when Sam Ballot, the Horonite, <laughs> and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to, to promote the welfare of the Israelites. When they heard that now he'd, he'd come into this, back to the city, and there was about to start the rebuilding, they were very much disturbed. That was the start of it, really. So I'm just going to read now from verse 11 in number 2. I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priest or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in? Stop there. <laughs> Stop there. This is four minutes to twelve. Do you see the trouble we are in. You see, he'd seen it from afar, hadn't he? He'd seen it from afar in Susa, miles away, miles away from Jerusalem. He'd seen it from afar, and he had to say to the people, do you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king has said to me. They replied, they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sambalat, the Horonite, verse 19 of 2, Tobiah the Ammonite, official, and Gershom the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they ask? Are you rebuilding against the king? Rebelling, sorry, not rebuilding. Rebelling against the king. I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We as servants will start rebuilding. One of the biggest things in the church today, and it's major, is division. We have experienced it ourselves in this place. Very much. Division Disunity has been one of the biggest causes. Yet here, we've got a situation where now they reply, let us start rebuilding. The best is yet to come, yet more opposition is yet to come, if you read Nehemiah. One minute. I was just brief with you on some of the opposition. I've just wrong here. There was great opposition, which began with discouragement and ridicule. And you read that 
in ver it's chapter 4, verse 13. Therefore I station some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by, fam by families with their swords, spears and bows. And that's, the, that's what he had to do. He had to think about what was happening. His heart was right, but he had to, what is happening here? The enemies was all around them. And just before that, you can read this. And these kind of things was happening time and time again in the opposition to the rebuilding that you get in chapter 4. It says, When Sambal, I'm starting at the, the verse, chap, chap, chapter 4, verse 1. When Sambal heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their war? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring back the stones back to life for the, from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Amorite, Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, if even a fox climbed up on it, it would break down their wall of stones. And then he prayed again, was saying, Here is O our God. So in chapter verse six of chapter four it says, So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached off its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sambalat Tobiah to, and Tobiah, the Arabs and the Ammonites and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and the gaps were being closed. They were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Now, just just look what happened all in this time. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble, we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to their work. Then, chap uh, chapter 4, verse 12, then the Jews who live near them came and told us ten times over, wherever we, we turn, they'll attack and kill us. All this was taking place. They'd built the wall up to halfway. And I haven't even got in to, in chapter 3, about how they built the wall. Do you know how they built the wall? There were seven gates, main gates. And it started with the chief priests, believe it or not. And there they was. I'm going to have to say this quickly, but there they was. At each, he was at the sheep gate first in chapter 3 of verse 1. And as you go through the different gates, you see that the people next, next to him, next to him, next to him, was building the wall. As they built the gates next to him, there was building, and next to him, they was not divided. They was not in two groups. There was not, they was as one at that time. And despite opposition to try and divide them, you read when they got, they got to that half height because they wasn't divided. Do you believe that? They got to that half height because they said, let us rebuild the wall. Let us rebuild. They wasn't divided. They stood as one. And now you've got this opposition when they got to halfway that tried to stop them. All these things that was going through. <coughs> I've got things in this bag. It's not time to bring them out yet.
but there's things in our lives that can be stopping us. There's things in our lives that can be holding us back, like the past, hurts, rejections, unforgiveness, holding us back to come into that place, to come into that place of victory, holding us back. But God has said, God has said that he will build us. He has said that the gates of hell shall not prevail over his church. Do you believe that? So even though this seems like a wake-up call to see there's positiveness to follow from this. There's positiveness to follow because is as in Nehemiah's time, they rebuilt the wall. They rebuilt the wall in 52 days. I've read that it was 11 miles long, 18 foot high and nine foot wide. Later on, however, during other periods of time, I do believe the wall went even higher. I think it was the Ottoman time when, when they would build the walls of Jerusalem even higher. But can you imagine? 18 foot high, 9 foot wide, and 11 miles long, with seven main gates, all the bars, all the, the, the bars, the hinges, the bolts, all had to be put into them gates. And in 50 days, it was completed because of God was with them, because God empowered them and empowered that vision. Amen. I'm going to leave it now. If that's all right with Julian, I've already spoke with Julian. But the follow on, we need to follow on. We need to see what God is going to do with us in this place because it's amazing what God does. Even in times when we don't expect it, in times when it seems dry and barren, God tells us to look up. Amen. Amen? So, if there's someone in here, I believe right now that God will give you a prayer that just to close this, if you'll just close this meeting as we come to this end of this meeting. Amen?